Uh, well, hello and uh, welcome. Thank you for tuning in. My name is George Osborne. Uh, I'm the teacher here at the SMBS Bible School this week, and we've been going through understanding evangelism. Uh, so we've been having about four days now of teaching on the topic of evangelism. So it's great to have you here. I'm an evangelist uh, from the UK, and I work for an organization called Lumina Ministries. So it's a real privilege to be here, and we just want to welcome you into this lesson. I know all the students want to welcome you as well, so I think they're going to give you a little wave. So we've been covering um, lots of topics this week, and we've been centering around what is evangelism, and uh, we've learned that evangelism is simply proclamation of the gospel, and we've been going through lots of different techniques, haven't we, for doing that. Well, this session, we're going to unpack how we actually verbalize the gospel message. Okay, how do we verbalize that gospel message? And we're going to give some kind of tips and tricks, if you like, for how you communicate that message. Okay, so... I think as I've said through this week, in terms of evangelism, opening your mouth is only one part of that process of verbalizing the gospel message. So what we're going to do in this particular session is have a look at a particular form of communication. Uh, many of you would have heard of somebody called Aristotle. Aristotle was a Greek uh, philosopher and he came up with a way of communication called the art of rhetoric. The art of rhetoric. And all that simply means is the art of communication, how we persuade somebody. Well, I hope um, as we've gone through this week as well, we've understood that as Christians and people doing evangelism, we're not salespeople. Yeah, we've discovered that we're news readers. We're to announce the news of what Jesus Christ has done. So as we go into this teaching, I don't want us to then make the mistake of thinking, well, it's all about how I persuade somebody is how that person comes to faith. Well, no, it happens supernaturally. But as we looked at in the last session, there are means and ways of communicating. Jesus himself, with that Samaritan woman at the well, he communicated in a gentle way, didn't he, at the beginning. He started naturally with her, and then he went on to spiritual things. So there was ways that he communicated. And we're going to have a look at some of those ways. So there's three kind of key areas that Aristotle gave us, okay? And these three key areas will come up on your screen. It's called ethos, pathos, and logos, okay? They sound like the three musketeers, don't they? Ethos, pathos, and logos. So these are just three modes of communication, Okay, so when we talk about communicating that gospel message that we've learned this week, how do we communicate that with these three areas? Okay, so what we're going to do in this session is we're going to have a look at those three areas, but we're going to have a look at, well, what is that? What is ethos, pathos, and logos? We need to understand what that is. So we're going to have a look at what it is. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to have a look at, well, how did Paul use that form of communication. So we're going to have a look at an example where Paul spoke to King Agrippa and he gave his testimony and he shared the gospel message. How did he incorporate these three things that we're going to look at? So we're going to look at how Paul used it. And then obviously, finally for us, well, how can we use that, that method of communication ourselves? How can we use it? Does that make sense? Some, some of you are looking a bit confused. If you've got questions or it doesn't make sense, do stop me through this session. You can just, you know, stick your hand up as normal. If you want me to slow down, just shout, okay? So this is slightly different terms we're going into here. So I know this is maybe a little bit more um, complicated. So let's begin by just looking at what it is, okay? So let's have a look at firstly, what is ethos? Does anybody know already what ethos is? Can anyone give us a, a definition here? Yep. Social standings, okay. Anybody else? A messenger, what ethos means? Good, yeah. So it's more that, so the background of the messenger. So it's really, we're beginning to talk about character. 
So ethos really means character. So let me um, go to Aristotle for his definition. And he said this. He said, persuasion is clearly a sort of demonstration. Since we are most fully persuaded when we consider a thing to have been demonstrated. So that's what Aristotle said about ethos. But let's have a look at a dictionary definition because I really want you to, to understand exactly what ethos is. Okay. So the dictionary definition of ethos is the distinctive character, spirit, or attitudes of a people, a culture, or an era. So I hope that makes a little bit more sense. So really, um, let's think of a company. You know, let's think of a company like um, Coca-Cola. Okay, Coca-Cola would have a particular ethos, a particular character, a particular thing that they're they're kind of known for. So a company like Google. They have a, an ethos or a character or a reputation of being quite modern and quite young and youthful. That is their ethos. That is their character. Okay? So that's what ethos means. It's, it's what is our character? Who are we as people? So before we even turn up to, to even open our, our mouths and our lips, we have a kind of ethos. You know, each of you have got a distinct type of character. So what we're talking about in communication is how do we display our character? How do people know who we are? So this is kind of talking about the things that we do really, our character. So what do people see in us? What do people see when we're out on the streets, when we're working in the homeless shelter or wherever it is? What is our character and how do we come across to people? What would people say about you? You know, George, what is what is George's character? Why well, is it? He's a bit of a joker. Maybe he likes to have a bit of fun. Maybe that's my kind of ethos. What's your ethos? But how do you come across? How do you hold yourself? How do you approach people? You know, if I'm walking up to Slavic, we keep picking on him this week. But if I walk up to to Slavic, what's he thinking as I come towards him? You know, am I sort of coming towards him as a bit of a you know, and up I come and I'm aggressive, and he thinks, "Whoa." You know, I'm, I'm displaying ethos just in my body language and who I am. But if I come up with a, a warm smile on my face and a bit more gentle and, you know, maybe that's going to show Slavic that my character is open and approachable. Well, the most important person for us to look at in terms of character is obviously Jesus, isn't it? So we need to know, well, what was Jesus' character? So let me give you a bit of a flavor of what I mean by character as well in the Bible. So Jesus was constantly noted for his character. Just think about those verses that are on your screen. So in, in Mark chapter 1, verse 22, and I've underlined these words just to show us what I'm kind of trying to get across here. So the people were amazed at his teaching. And notice that verse doesn't say, doesn't say they were amazed at his teaching because of the words that he used. What were they amazed at? It was an authority. Yeah. And that's not, that's not words necessarily, is it? It's, you know when somebody comes with authority, they have a sort of a presence, don't they? And don't we often hear that described of Jesus, you know, in the, in the Bibles or when people even read the Bibles? They know there's, there's something about this man. They can't quite put their finger on it, but it's his character. It's his, how he displays who he is. So he comes across as somebody with authority. Again, in Matthew 7, verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority. So they had seen many people stand up in front of them and teach, but Jesus stood up and teach and something came from him that was different. And that wasn't the words that he necessarily used. It was his persona, his ethos, his character. So I just want to highlight that when we go out and share the gospel message, it's not just you share the message and that's it. That's you communicate as well with who you are. Okay, so your character will communicate to people as well. So I guess it's talking about our love or the way we are backs up what we're saying. So Aristotle gave these three key areas, really, when it talks about character. So he said we should have good moral character. So Aristotle is talking about when we speak to an audience or when we're speaking one-on-one. -on -one, this is how we should kind of come across in communication. We should have a good character. 
We should make good sense. We should come across with a good will, you know. So I'm not trying to get at people. So when I'm, I'm sharing the gospel message with someone, they know that I'm doing it out of love, not out of, oh, I just want to get the message out and I just want to tell this person about Jesus. No, I want to, I want to tell them about Jesus because I love them. So I want, I want them to feel that from me when I'm, when I'm with them, when I'm sharing the gospel message. I want them to feel something from me. So I hope this is making sense. Is there any questions on ethos at the moment? Yeah, go on. Not really. Ego is more about who, who you are, your pride, what's your, you know. Ethos is more, it's more who you are as a person. Do you know what I mean? Ego is, is about pride, really, more than anything else. So ethos is your, is your character. So let's try and think of some examples. Like, if, if there's probably somebody in this class that you know has got a particular personality, and you, you just sort of, you, you know. That's his ethos. So can anyone think of anyone in this, in this class that's got a particular thing? You think of that person, you just think, he's funny, or he's clever, or... It's, that's their kind of ethos, how they come across to somebody, yeah? Their vibe, yeah. Their vibe. So it's the thing that comes across without necessarily using words. It's just, just their character. So think of a company. Do you know a company in your mind... And you think of that company, and straight away you think of a particular ethos of that company. You know the flavor of that company. DMV, see, I've not even heard of that company. What is that company? What do you think of? <laughs> well, there you go. That's their e they come across as negative. That's an ethos, isn't it? Their character. McDonald's, what would we say of McDonald's? What do they come across at? Profit-making, I don't know. Unhealthy. Yeah, so McDonald's comes across as unhealthy. That's the first thing often we think of, isn't it? So McDonald's are constantly trying to change their ethos, their character, how they come across. So now they're trying to come across as if they're more healthy. So they put more salads on their menu and they're trying to change their character. They're, it's not brand, but it's that sort of first impression you get of something. Okay? So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a look at a passage in Acts, and we're going to play an audio um, clip of this particular passage. It's in English, but you can follow along in your Bibles. And what I'd love, love us to do in Acts 26, so turn to Acts 26, and this is a kind of a dramatic reading of this passage. So it's pretty authentic, I think, this audio that you're about to hear. There's a bit of music in the background that probably wouldn't have been around at the time playing music. But I want us, as we're listening to this and reading along, I want you to picture yourself in this situation. Okay? So Paul is before King Agrippa, and he's got this whole court, probably a number of people like we've got here, and King Agrippa has asked him to stand up and give a defense of himself and what it is that he's proclaiming. So as we listen to this audio, you can close your eyes, you can follow along in the, in the passage, but just put yourself in this situation. What's going on? How does Paul's character, how does he display his character in this passage? How does he get that across to King Agrippa, who he is as a person? So let's have a listen to this. Then Agrippa said to Paul, You are permitted to speak for yourself. So Paul stretched out his hand and answered, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know, they knew me from the first if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged 
for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise are 12 tribes, earnestly serving God night and day, hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied, as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of the things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God, and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Ah, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. When he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves. This man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Okay. So it's a pretty authentic recording, I think, of what may have happened at that time, bar the music in the background. But... It gives us a flavor, doesn't it, of what was going on. So can anyone kind of pick out any verses or any sentences there where Paul was displaying his ethos? How did Paul display his ethos? And don't worry, just have a go if you think, oh, I'm not quite sure what it is yet. Don't, don't worry, let's just have a go and try and learn and get a grip on what ethos is. 
So can anyone pick out anything there where Paul talked about ethos? Brilliant. So talking about there, he was talking about what, when he was a Pharisee and when he was a, a persecutor of Christians. So he was talking about his character, wasn't he? So he's talking to that audience and he's saying, look, this was, this is my character before. This is what I was like before. So yeah, that's a brilliant one. Yep, go on. Mm -hmm. Okay. Where was that verse? Show us that verse so we can all see that. Okay. So I think on verse, verse 12, he was talking about that journey to Damascus. So verse 12, it says, On one of these journeys, I was going to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests. About noon, O king, I was on the road. I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, blazing around me and my companions. So he's, he's trying to display to this audience, look, this was what my character was like before. I was persecuting uh, Christians. I was having a go at them. I was killing them. I saw this thing happen on the road. And then the next stage, my character had changed. And now I'm like this, King Agrippa. So can you see how he's trying to display who he is as a, as a person? Yeah. yeah. So just saying there that verse 11, Paul was saying how much he was persecuting Christians. He's trying to, again, just highlight what he was like before. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, so it's taught with respect and humility. So his character, he's trying to display. But think about that as well, how he communicates himself to King Agrippa. Look at um, as well, verse 4. The Jews all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child. So you all know, you know what my character's like, he's saying. You know who I was. So he's appealing to them. You know, you know who I am as a person. You've seen it yourselves. So just saying, instead of arguing back with King Agrippa, he kept his cool. So when King Agrippa sort of attacked him and called him crazy, and he was gentle and he was answering him back, yeah. So these are some of the ones that I've kind of picked out. And again, it's not exhaustive, but these are some of the verses, say 4, 5, 19, 20, and the others that we've picked out. But his open display of his character, his demonstration of his change of character, and Paul's faith was not private, was it? Do you notice that as well in verse 32? So it's not as if he's this sort of Christian that just tucks himself away in the church somewhere and he's just sort of hiding his faith. He's, he's saying, look, I was, I was open about who I am. Everyone can see who I am as a person. So he's not hidden. So there's a challenge there for us as well in our ethos. People won't know your character unless you are out and about. So let's be careful that we don't just stay in that Christian circle and we don't ever go outside of the church. So Paul is saying, I was out and about, you know who I am as a person. So Paul's faith was very public in that situation. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, so let's move on then to, well, how can we use ethos? And I just want to give you a verse to to kind of think about for this really. But it's uh, a verse in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2, uh, verse 14. And it's, I think this highlights the ethos thing very well because it says this, But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance, the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. And I think that verse captures ethos in a really good way. Because you can't really describe a fragrance, can you? If I said to you, you know, just des describe the, your favorite aftershave. What does it smell like? You could say, well, it smells, it's sort of bouquet, it smells of flat. It's, but you, you know what it smells like as soon as you smell it, don't you? As soon as you smell that, that fragrance, it brings back a memory or whatever it is. If you love the smell of bacon, it just conjures up something in your mind, doesn't it? Straight away, as soon as you smell it. So it's a bit like this verse is kind of telling us that as we go around the place, we should, we should smell of Jesus Christ. We should smell of him. There should be a fragrance of Christ just in the way that we carry ourselves, the way that we are in this world. So we should smell of Jesus Christ. And I think that's a beautiful picture. Okay, And again, just to remind us of that verse in Peter, that we, we're to give a gentle and respectful answer. That's our part of our character as well. So really in ethos, we're talking about actions as well. 
So what are our actions? How do we act as people? You know, do go out and bake a cake. Do go and help that homeless person. Do give them some food. Display your character as Paul did in this passage here. Okay? So let's let's move on to um, pathos. To pathos. Has anyone any ideas what pathos might be then? Yep, go for it. An appeal to the emotions. Brilliant. You can't really get a better definition than that. So pathos is an appeal to emotions. So this definition here says uh, a quality or an experience of art that arouses feelings of pity, sympathy, tenderness or sorrow. So we're beginning to talk about emotions in this particular. So pathos is emotions. Yeah? So what do I mean by that? So when you're sharing the gospel with somebody, how do you appeal to their emotions or how do you um, show your emotion as well. So it's sympathy. How do you empathize with that person? Now, let's not fall into the trap here as well of thinking that in this setting, when we're talking about emotions, that we're actually saying um, you should manipulate people and you know put on really good music and create an environment where they'll emotionally respond to the gospel. We're not saying that, but we should be able to speak to their emotions. And I want to show you biblically why that is is possible as well. So um, if you look at Acts 2.40, we don't need to go there in your Bibles, but Acts 2.40 talks about this. Listen to these words. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them. And this word plead is an emotional word. Okay, So pleading is emotional. You're pleading. You're pleading with somebody. So you're trying to get across to their emotions. Okay, So you're speaking to somebody's heart. And uh, if you remember the prodigal son story, the father went out to that second son. And do you remember the word that he used there? He talked about he begged his son to come into the party. He begged. Okay, so that, that word beg is, again, it's emotional. Can you imagine someone getting on one knee and begging you? Well, that's, that's the description of God. That's what God does to this older son. He's kind of begging and pleading with him. Um, Peter, in his great sermon, his first great famous sermon, he pleaded with the audience. He pleaded with them with many words, trying to persuade them that they needed to repent. So that's what we're talking about here with pathos. Okay, We're talking about emotion. So those kind of words that you see around the edge of this, this picture, it's empathy, it's compassion, it's, it's sympathy. It's trying to communicate in those ways. So let me try this next picture out on you. Oh, you see? So that's what I'm talking about. That emotion (laughs) that just hit the room the moment I brought that slide up is what I'm talking about. The whole room went, oh. Even you men in the room went, oh. See the sweet little cat, oh. So we're looking at that cat. It evokes emotion in us. Straight away it connected to our hearts, didn't it? These big brown eyes, these. So that's what we're talking about with pathos. You're You're trying to connect with somebody's heart. So yesterday we looked at apologetics and we looked at speaking to the mind. But now we're beginning to say actually sometimes you need to speak to the heart. And we listened to uh, a defense from Ravi Zacharias, an apologist. But if you listen to him, he'll often share a story when he gives an answer. And story is a great way to connect with people. Okay, so story, share your testimony or, or share an experience. What did Jesus often do? How did he communicate? Made up stories, parables, didn't he? So he spoke in that language because it often spoke to the heart. So let's zoom in on Paul again. Let's remember that passage. So how did Paul display emotion? Can anyone pick any verses out of that passage? How did Paul do it? How did Paul use emotion or connect with King Agrippa emotionally? It's a little bit more difficult, isn't it, to detect? Yeah, go on. Yeah. 
Yep, so it's just saying, talking about um, Paul's asked King Agrippa for patience. You know, be, be patient with me. Yeah. Yep, so he's just trying to connect, isn't he, with King Agrippa. King Agrippa, will you, will you be patient with me? But before that, I noticed something. I don't know if you noticed even before that verse. Think about verse 2. Do you see anything there that could connect with someone emotionally? Possibly. I'm thinking even his name. His name. So he said King Agrippa. He just used his name. Doesn't that connect with you emotionally? I don't know, uh, Starbucks um, here. Does Starbucks here ask for your name when you get a coffee? Do you know why they do that? Is it just because they want to know your name and they're nice people? or Do you think there could be a reason behind that? Yeah, they want to know whose coffee goes to who. But ultimately, it's about connecting with you personally. So when I'm in the queue and I'm waiting for my coffee and someone goes, George, your coffee's ready. I'm like, oh, you know, they know me. There's a kind of, oh, yeah, thanks, my coffee, you know. You feel a bit more connected. And that's why they do it. So that's why often in, in companies as well, they'll put the name tag on somebody. So you feel this person is a, is a name. It's not just a, a, an object. They're a person. We're trying to connect the two. So he uses his name. So if, you, if you're speaking to someone about the gospel, use, you know, what's your name? Oh, Slavic. Hi, Slavic. I'm George. You know, we're just, we're getting to know each other. We're trying to connect emotionally. Go on. That's a good one as well. So talking, yeah, talking about verse 29, saying, I don't, I don't want to be you to be in these chains. I, I love you. He's kind of almost saying that to him, isn't he? I, I care about you. So he's connecting with his heart in that way, yeah. So he's saying he cares about him. And he shares his story. So testimony is another way to connect with somebody's heart. Remember the testimonies we did yesterday? Do you remember those particular ones that were emotional? Did they affect you more? They, they did, you know, that, that one where people were a bit more difficult. And it was, but it was real emotional connection. It connected with you. Yeah? That's a really good point. So he says to King Agrippa, you, you know these things, King Agrippa. You've, you've seen this thing. So he's almost sort of putting his arm around him and saying, look, you've, you've seen this, haven't you, King Agrippa? You know, he's, he's trying to get alongside him. So he's not speaking above him or over him. You know, he's his friend. He's trying to get alongside him. Yeah, good. So I think he picked out loads there. So, just to reiterate, he's, and he says in verse 3, I, I beg you, I beg you. So he uses that word plead, I beg you, King Agrippa, I beg you, please, please hear me out today. Okay, so again, let's just remind ourselves how we can use that, how can we use pathos? Well, again, it's that, that verse, so just keep remembering. What is your fragrance? How do you communicate emotionally with people? Let me try another picture out on you as well. Does that picture get you? Oh, look, there you go again. <laughs> so do we appeal to people emotionally? Do we plead with our neighbours and our friends? You know, someone's come up to me about um, somebody that they've been sharing Jesus with, even while we've been in these lessons, and they're, they're pleading with them on text message. So do we, do we do that? Please turn to Christ. You know, please will you turn to Christ? Are we pleading or do we share the gospel just, oh, here you go, you know, yeah, Jesus died for your sins and that's it. All right, see ya, you know, do, 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 you know it's just another thing. Or are we, please, will you turn to Jesus? Please, because it's so important. It's such a big thing. So we, we want to appeal emotionally. So are you communicating that this is the best news in the world? Are you using your emotions to communicate with other people? Put yourself in their shoes as well. Empathy. Is there any questions on, on pathos? You all still with me? I'm not going to have to get my bazooka out, am I? No? Okay. Right, should we have a look at Logos then? So what is Logos? Go on, you know the answers this one. Okay. Okay, you should get up and do this lesson. So yeah, an appeal to logic or facts. So it's really, it's words, isn't it? So we're beginning to talk about the word, reason. Yeah, And it's just an interesting thing to note that this word logos is the same words that are used in the beginning of John. John's Gospel. You remember when it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God? Well, that, that word is logos. In the beginning was logos, and the logos was with God. So reason and logic come from God himself. In fact, it is 
Jesus. Jesus is Logos. Jesus is the reason. Okay? So that's what we're beginning to communicate now in this section. We're beginning to communicate Jesus and who he is. That's what we mean in this particular presentation. So it's, it's Logos. It's reason. Can anyone think of an example? Can anyone think of an example of a clever argument? Or No? Okay, yep. Yeah. Like yeah. So, so just saying about um, when communicating Jesus using Old Testament prophecies is a great way to come across as reasonable. I think it is when you present Jesus in a logical kind of way through the whole Bible, that's very reasonable when you get to the end to think this Jesus is real, Jesus is true. Can I give you Aristotle's definition here of Logos as well? Let's have a look at what Aristotle himself said. He said, a statement is persuasive and credible either because it's directly self-evident or because it appears to be proved from other statements that are so. So facts that are combined with other statements show something to be reasonable. So I could say, for example, my car is red. Okay, my car is red. But you might not believe that because you've got no evidence. But if I start saying to you, my car is red and Slavic has seen it and he's seen that it's red, so my car is red. So now it's becoming more logical and it's making more sense and it's more believable. So when you present something, if you can back it up with other arguments, so even like you're saying with the prophecies and if we can back Jesus up with other logical arguments, it will make sense to people. So you have a kind of major argument, a major thing, a statement that you're saying, and then you've got this kind of minor statement underneath saying why that is, is true. And then you come to your conclusion. So Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. All the prophecies point to him, minor kind of argument. So therefore, it's true and reasonable to expect Jesus to be true, who he is. Okay, yeah, go on. Yeah, so talking about, you know, other witnesses coming in, you know, I've seen this thing, and look, these other people can witness and testify that I've seen this thing. So it becomes more credible. So you're coming up with a statement, I've seen Jesus alive. That's your major statement. Then you're saying, John and George and Paul and whoever, they saw it as well. So that's your second statement. So it backs up the truth. So the conclusion is, it must be true. Okay, so you're just trying to reinforce this all the time. Has anyone come across C.S. Lewis? Has anyone read some of his stuff? He's great, isn't it? This sort of stuff as well. Has anyone heard his argument, the lunatic liar lord? That's what we're talking about with, with Logos, okay? That's what we're talking about. So C.S. Lewis's argument um, for Jesus was saying, look, Jesus is either a lunatic, he's either a, a liar, or... He's who he claims to be. And then he begins to show how he's not a lunatic, how he's not a liar. So therefore, the only conclusion can be that he must be Lord. You see? So he, he comes up with an argument, so it becomes logical. So those are your three options. He's either a complete crazy person, and he's just making things up, this Jesus. Well, let's have a look at the Bible. Let's have a look. Is Jesus a lunatic? You might want to get a few verses to back up and show, well, Jesus isn't a lunatic. So that's that one out. Is Jesus a liar? Is he making things up? Does he appear to be a liar? Well, let's get some verses from the Bible and show that it doesn't appear to, that Jesus is a liar. So we throw that one out. So what's our only option? Well, Jesus is Lord. He's who he claimed to be. Okay, so we're just trying to display a reasonable argument. So don't get too lost in this because there can be a, a temptation to think, oh, I've got to, you know, when I go out and share the gospel, I've got to. You do it anyway. Whenever you present stuff, you, you present it in a logical and reasonable way. But we're just saying, present your argument and then back it up. Don't just say, the Bible's true. Get on your knees and turn to Jesus. You say, the Bible is true and this is why I found it to be true. Okay? Any questions at the moment? 
So how does Paul display reasonableness in his argument? Can people come up with some verses in this passage that we've been looking at? How does Paul display... Yeah. Okay, so just picking up on verse 4. Yeah, the Jews all know the way I've lived ever since I was a child, from the beginning of my life in my own country and also in Jerusalem. So even that is just saying, look, this is reasonable. You've, you've seen it. You know, what I'm saying about Jesus, look, you've, you've seen who I am. So he's appealing to that witness, you know. You've seen this happen. You've seen this happen, yeah. Any others? That, that hard to yeah. So he's appealing to um, saying that God raised him from the dead. Why is it hard to believe? You've all been, you've all been here. So it's just the same stuff. The, these are the verses that I kind of pulled out in that passage about logos. So remember, we talked about the four key areas of the gospel message. Remember that? Can anyone remember the four key areas? Number one, why we must be saved. It's on your screens. You're still awake. Yeah. Why we must be saved. How Jesus saves us what we must do, and Paul goes through that. He goes through that logical argument. He presents the gospel through that whole passage. Okay, We don't have time uh, in this session now to unpack all of that. Um, but if you need those notes again, I can come back to it. But Logos is just simply presenting the words of who Jesus is, presenting him in a reasonable way. So in conclusion, um, we need to learn the message, don't we? This is stuff that we've gone through all week. We need to understand the reasons behind that message. We need to be prepared to give that reason, that reason, remember Logos again in 1 Peter, that reason for the hope that we have in Christ. So be prepared. So do you think that you can't do these kind of three things? You might be sat there thinking, oh, there's a lot of information there. How am I ever going to remember all that as I go out? You can do it. You can do it. And as I close, I want to play you a short video that's going to appeal to ethos, pathos, and logos. Okay? And if you're sitting there thinking, I can't do this evangelism, I can't get out there and do it, how am I? I haven't got the skills or the equipment. I Please watch this video because I've seen this lots of different times and it appeals to me every time. We can do this. Okay? We can do this. Sarah was born in April of 1976. Um, at first it wasn't obvious that she had any disabilities, but we found out when she was about a year old that she had cerebral palsy. As a disabled person, I don't get out of the house much, so my opportunities to share my faith are very limited. When I heard about Global Media Outreach at my church, I wanted to be a part of it. I knew that this would be a good opportunity for me. I've wanted to go on mission trips and things, but I feel like that's pretty impossible. And thus I felt unable to do part of what the Lord told us to do. For me, it's a quiet marvel. When we hear the Lord say, go into the world, and we want with all of our hearts to do that, and that we, but, but we realize that I can't do that, that He says, oh, <laughs> I have a way. I make what Working with Global Media Outreach allows me to share the knowledge and experience I have as a Christian. It also allows me to pray for different people all over the world. I hear from someone who has either just gotten saved or has rededicated his life to the Lord most every day. I've started writing someone lately who seems very interested in knowing more. By that, I think he's pretty hungry for the Lord. Getting a chance to see Sarah work as an online missionary was probably one of the most exciting and humbling experiences I've ever had. And the things that she has to go through just to answer one email, it's amazing to me. But to see that she does it with such a, such a willing spirit and a desire to reach the lost, 
She's doing what every Christian on the face of the earth should be doing, and that's sharing the good news of the gospel. She's being a witness for Jesus. She's taken what God's given her and said, let me use that to glorify him. And so here she is, someone who can't even feed herself, giving out the bread of life to so many thousands of people. Through my work with GMO, I have seen that God can use me and anyone else he wants to further his kingdom. And I like being useful. As disabled as I am, sometimes it feels like all I do is have others do for me. I don't feel like I give much back. GMO is definitely a place I can give back to the Lord. It's awesome to me that that he has called her and with the calling provided her the 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 work using a computer is something most people can do email is kind of an equalizer for me working with gmo allows me to be in touch with new believers from every part of the world my life may be very limited because of my disability but through global media outreach i can touch the world Isn't that humbling? So if she can do it, we can all do it, can't we? So I'll see you for the next lesson, yeah?